Previously on the Main Street Chronicles, Archimedes introduced Walt and Sam to Walt Disney's first Imagineer, Disney legend Roger Brogy. As this unexpected journey continues to weave through the origins of Imagineering history, our travelers hop aboard the Roger E. Brogy replica from the Walt Disney World Railroad as our historians discuss how Roger himself helped make all of Walt's dreams come to life. Anything that Walt wanted to make move, Roger made it happen. Let's listen in as our travelers meet yet another Disney Imagineering legend. Right this way, hurry along, let's not dawdle. Lots of exciting things to see. Hey Archimedes, slow down, what's the big rush? I'm just so excited to show you this new section that we just completed. Let me please introduce to you... Oh my goodness, this is absolutely amazing. Mark Davis! Well, this exhibit looks more like he was an animator than an Imagineer. Why, yes, sir, beautiful work, isn't it? Walt Disney actually said of Mark, Mark can do a story. He can do character. He can animate. He can design shows for me. All I have to do is tell him what I want, and it's there. He's my renaissance man. So, of course, his exhibit must encompass that, or we wouldn't be doing him justice. Mark was also one of Walt's nine old men. I see. And what are the nine old men? Walt's nine old men were his original core animators that worked on Disney films from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs to the Rescuers. Archimedes, do you have a hall for the nine old men? Not yet, my dear. Maybe someday soon we will. Well, I'll tell you one thing. He clearly has a pattern of what he's good at. Leading ladies and animals. And that is a really interesting combination. I mean, wow, look at this mural. I can see Snow White, Bambi, Flower, Br'er Bear, Br'er Fox, Br'er Rabbit. Cinderella, Alice, Tinkerbell, Aurora, and Maleficent. Cinderella, oh, and even Mr. Toad. I love Mr. Toad. And hey, what's this? Oh, that's Mark's sketchbook. Well, one of many that we have on loan. Feel free to gently look through the pages. Wow, these are incredible. Let me tell you a little about each character while you look through the sketchbook. While at the Disney studio, Mark was tasked with bringing human characters to life, which was actually one of the most difficult jobs to do at the time. Bambi was a caricature of nature versus reality. Mr. Toad and the characters from Song of the South are an example of slapstick comedic characters. He was also tasked with doing the important female characters of the time. Tinkerbell, Alice from Alice in Wonderland, Cinderella, which included Walt's favorite scene of all time, the one where she went from rags to riches. He even oversaw the animation for Maleficent and Princess Aurora. This was an example of good versus evil in the animation styles. He even took on Cruella de Vil, which was full body movement to convey attitude and intention, which made her move like someone you didn't like. This character was actually based off of one of his wife's friends. <laughs> Press the button to learn more about Mark's passion for art and how he helped shape Walt's vision into reality. Mark used his sketchbook to create some of the most iconic ladies in Disney film history. Think princesses. This is how he earned the title of Ladies' Man. Mark is responsible for sketching Walt's favorite scene from Cinderella by bringing animation to Cinderella being transformed into the princess she is meant to be by her fairy godmother. He had an eye for transformation and animation and the skill to make it happen in his sketchbook. Now Mark was one of those animators that took his sketchbook everywhere. Now this allowed him to quickly sketch anything and everything that he observed. Some of the places that he would go were the zoo, where he could he could sketch all the animals and their behaviors and their movements, and he would also sketch people that he would see as they're walking by. One of the things that he enjoyed studying was the Civil War studies, which would later work hand-in-hand -hand with the creation of the Abraham Lincoln animatronic for Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln. And the scenes that he would sketch would help lead the way for It's a Small World. This observance influenced his animation style. He became obsessed with motion and how he could perfect movements in animation to create more believable characters. And his characters included both humans and animals. It is interesting when you look at the, some of the release pages from his sketchbook, you do see a direct correlation 
between what he was actually seeing and learning from and the characters that he ends up creating. Uh, you mentioned that he was obsessed with motion, and it's being able to look at something, whether it's studying Civil War, whether it's studying animals, and not just look at the way they look, but the way that they move. And he was able to bring that style to his animation and make things more realistic. And it's one thing that set Disney animation apart at the time. Absolutely. I mean, his animation, it, it flowed. And you could tell which characters marked it because they had, a more, they had more realistic movement. And they, not to repeat myself, but they, they were more real. The animals were more lifelike. Case in point, Bambi. I mean, you can't get any more real than than those characters right there. Exactly. I think the prime example from Bambi is uh, when Bambi's walking on the ice and just the movement there uh, is very natural as if a baby deer was trying to walk on ice, right? Falling all over the place and not just in like a slapstick funny way, but kind of a realistic movement way. Right. I mean, that was, they spent hours and they still do this today where they study their subject. I remember reading that Walt brought live deer into the studio so that way they can study the movement, the texture, so that way it was as real as possible. Exactly, and Mark Davis is one of the ones that was so committed to his craft. Carrying that sketchbook everywhere showed that he didn't just take his work seriously, uh, but that it almost wasn't even work to him. It was his lifestyle, and that's why he became such a trusted member uh, of Walt's staff. It's another reason why he's an inaugural member of our Hall of Imagineering because he paved the way for all of those to come behind him. Disney legend animator Glenn Keane said, Mark Davis' sketches are a wonderful testimony to his finely honed skills of observation. These sketches are a record of not just what he saw, but the way he saw, and Mark saw deeply. Every drawing was done in such a manner as to communicate the character of the person or animal he was observing. He drew with an eye for the audience never forgetting that he was drawing to present an idea to the viewer in the most interesting and entertaining way possible. Discovering the unique characteristics of the individual was Mark's goal. Little things count, and these kinds of details mattered to Mark, because to him, they made it real. He lived in the skin of what he drew, feeling the motions, weight, and movement of each subject. Well, carrying his sketchbook everywhere surely explains why it is so worn. Can you imagine the stories these pages must be able to tell? Hey, what is this sketch of a rooster from? I don't recognize it. Well, if you turn around, you'll see a maquette of the character Chanticleer. This was created for Mark to help develop the character. So why did he need a sculpture to help him create the character? Well, my boy, maquettes are actually still used today. It's a lesser known contribution to animated films, but each character is created in maquette form which is a small-scale or desk-sized reference statue. These statues are used to help the animator visualize the characters in 3D and from every angle. Well, you are really teaching me a lot of things that I didn't know, and I have a sneaky suspicion that you're just getting started. Ha ha ha! You'll just have to be patient and wait and see. Let's listen as our historians tell us more about this lost Disney project. Although Mark and Ken Anderson worked very hard over the course of a few months creating lots of concept art, the other animators were more interested in Bill Peet's The Sword in the Stone because they had doubts that a rooster would be able to be sympathetic. On the other hand, the board of the studio headed by Roy Disney was trying to convince Walt to halt production on animated features entirely so that he could put his finances towards his two theme parks. Though he would not agree to the former proposal, Walt did decide that one of the two projects currently in development at the studio would have to be shelved. The reason why? The Sword in the Stone was kept over Chanticleer because it was cheaper to animate humans than it was animals. The Chanticleer project was also a really good showcase of Mark Davis's talents. Davis even personally believes that this was some of his best character work. However, due to that fading interest, the cost that goes along with the film, the other projects like Sword in the Stone, and especially the theme parks, uh, at the time, the project was shelved, and all of Mark Davis's work on that was kind of put to the side. However, this did represent a good transition point in Mark Davis's career with the Disney Company. Walt recognized his talent with character work uh, in animation and decided to use that in the theme park realm as well. You're spot on there, because this was a critical point in the company's history, and it was a great way for Mark to transition into a more 
interactive medium. And we, we've already talked about how he was always striving to, to be more than what he was. He was the, the, on the forefront of, of motion. Now he can actually animate and have his characters come to life. This being the early 1960s, what comes in the early 1960s but the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair, which was one of the things that Mark would be heavily involved in. That's true, and the 64-65 World's Fair was only going to be a starting point for Mark Davis with his involvement in Imagineering. He would go on to become one of the most influential story and character developers in the theme parks at the time. Charles Solomon, an internationally respected critic and historian of animation, once said about Mark, Mark Davis always spoke with special affection and bitterness about Chanticleer, an ambitious film that was never completed, but that he felt included some of his finest work. Although Mark and the rest of his crew produced countless drawings, scenarios, and ideas for songs for their version of Chanticleer, their full project would never see the light of day. After months of work, the story crew set up an elaborate presentation of their artwork to pitch the film. We finally had a meeting, and it was a strange meeting, as I remember Davis said. The business people had the attitude that it takes too long to do these features. They cost too much, and Walt shouldn't do them anymore. They walked out, and that was that. But Walt knew Mark's talents could be applied to theme park attractions as well as films. He moved Mark to Wet Enterprises. Animation's loss was a gain for Disneyland, the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair, and Walt Disney World. It is a real shame that we never got to experience what he thought was his best work. Walt, where are you going? Oh, I'm just going to go wander around, kind of take it all in. Walt, wait. Don't turn around. Around... What the? Well, Walt, it looks like you met Little Squirt from the Jungle Cruise. <laughs> Archimedes, is Little Squirt okay? Is, is he what? Is, is he okay? What about me? Oh, uh, you're fine. Walk it off. This is an artifact, though. Hmm. Oh, yes. He'll be just fine. So what's the deal with a full-size baby elephant in the middle of this section of the hall? Ha ha ha! Well, this is to help showcase Mark's transition from animation to Imagineering. This is a full-size working replica of the baby elephant from the Indian elephant bathing pool scene from the Jungle Cruise, which you can find in most Disney Magic Kingdom style parks. Oh, a working replica? Ugh. And it just sprayed me. Serves you right for running into him, silly. Now, now, let's get back on track. Press the button on the video board there to learn all about how Mark transitioned from being an animator to being one of the most influential Imagineers we will ever know. The story goes that Walt had overheard a child asking their mother to go on the jungle cruise, and the mother had said they shouldn't waste their time because nothing had been changed on the attraction. This is where the idea for plussing up attractions came from. In 1961, Walt's desire for change landed on the Jungle Cruise because the waterlogged animatronics were constantly breaking down. Walt even joked that he only knew they worked because he had seen it on television. Walt gave Mark Davis the task of improving the ride experience for the Jungle Cruise. Mark, being the humorous man that he was, decided to alter the Jungle Cruise into the version we know today, a hilarious jaunt through the rivers of Asia and Africa. He was responsible for the men on the totem pole above the rhinoceros, along with the joke that goes with them, they'll get the point, in the end, which is a legendary Jungle Cruise joke now. He also designed the concepts for the pygmy canoes, infamous sleeping zebra, and enhanced the Indian elephant bathing pool. Mark is most known for the characters that he created inside of the attractions of Disneyland. Inside the Jungle Cruise, he created the sight gags and the humor, such as the rhinos chasing the safari crew and the happy elephants in the bathing pool. For the Carousel of Progress, he created the famous Uncle Orville and his invention of air cooling. Pirates of the Caribbean, you can see his influence everywhere. In the Haunted Mansion, you can see his influence as well as many other Imagineers, especially one that we'll talk about next month. He, along with Albertino, created what we know as Grizzly Hall and all of the bears inside of the Country Bear Jamboree. He was also influential on great moments with Mr. Lincoln in Disneyland. He, along with his wife, Alice Davis and Mary Blair created as a small world. He also created the characters for World of Motion that was in the 1964-1965 New York World's Fair as the Ford Magic Skyway and then went over to Epcot as the World of Motion. And he was also one of the creators of the Enchanted Tiki Room. Mark Davis's biggest contribution to the theme parks definitely was in that character development. 
all of those attractions that you just listed are some of the most iconic in theme parks around the world of all time. And it's his characters that really set that story and that experience apart for guests and become the most memorable parts of those experiences. I also think his work with those characters can really easily be tied back to what we talked about in episode one with Mickey's Ten Commandments. If you look at commandment number nine, it says, For every ounce of treatment, provide a ton of fun. Mark Davis's work with these characters and creating these more interactive, humorous, and memorable experiences helped lay the foundation for a term that's kind of been coined as edutainment. You want to educate people, but you want to make sure they're entertained and enjoying the experience at the same time. And a lot of that work has been seen and continues to be talked about with Epcot especially. That's awesome that you were able to tie episode one into this and with the Ten Commandments. If you look at the Haunted Mansion, you can see the different styles. Where when Rolly Crump created the idea, it was the Museum of the Weird. And we'll get into that later on in the season. And then you have Claude Coates, who we'll discuss later on in the season as well. He's more serious when it becomes the Haunted Mansion attraction when it's no longer a walking tour, when it becomes a ride-through attraction. And with that, Walt said, it can't be scary. You've got to have some fun. So he looked to Mark. With Mark having the humor in his work, that allowed the Haunted Mansion to be the attraction that it is today. Because I think, and this is just my opinion, if it was the dark route that Claude Coates wanted to go down or the Museum of the Weird that Rolly Crump wanted to go, I don't think it would have stayed around for decades like it has today. It's with Mark's humor and Mark's influence that all of these classic Disney attractions are still classic attractions today. Exactly, and I think it's also important to note his contrasting styles even when it comes down to his work with animatronics in the theme park. Earlier on it was mentioned that he worked with Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln, and when you're looking at the animatronics that go into, for example, just the Lincoln animatronic, or whenever you go to the Hall of Presidents and see all of them there in front of you, they're meant to look very realistic and look as much like those people as possible. And it's incredible to see the work that they do because when that curtain opens up and you see that animatronic there, you almost think that it is that person. So it's impressive that he's able to work on things like Lincoln with such accuracy. But when you contrast that with Pirates, for example, where it is supposed to be, we, talk, we keep mentioning the humor in there, and he's trying to throw in these very quick scenes that you go by and you just have to be entertained and you just have a quick look into it. When you look at those pirates, they do look like real people, but the facial features have been exaggerated. They almost look more cartoony. So almost the, like a caricature. It, exactly, right? So you are going from trying to make something look like a specific person like Lincoln to something that's more there for entertainment. So when you're looking at the, the pirates, they do have exaggerated features, they do have funny facial expressions, things like that. Again, for entertainment and memorable purposes. So now let's, we've, t we've tied it back to episode one. Now let's tie it back to the first artifact that we talked about here. Mark's sketchbook, where he sketched animals and people, as well as scenes. All of those things now have come full circle, where he can animate the animals in Jungle Cruise. He can do the scenes in It's a Small World, and he can do humans in Great Moments with Mr. Lincoln and Pirates of the Caribbean. It's like, Disney legend and now an inaugural member of the Hall of Imagineering, Marty Sklar, had this to say about Mark. Today, we can look back over the six decades since Walt Disney's original Magic Kingdom. Disneyland opened its gates on July 17, 1955, and marked the milestones in the development of a new entertainment art form. The simplicity of the park's opening day attractions was, in fact, a big step beyond the amusement parks of the day. Yet the potential of the medium was only hinted at when Disneyland came on the scene. Mark Davis, of course, was central to Walt's expansion plans. When Mark moved from feature animation to Imagineering, his initial assignment from Walt was to go to Disneyland and report his thoughts. Mark's suggestion? The park needed more humor. Hearing all the attractions he influenced is blowing my mind. Looking at those attractions and knowing that he worked on them... I can absolutely see his influence on the different sections of each one of those attractions. It's incredible. Archimedes? Yes? Why does the Haunted Mansion only look to have a small influence by Mark? Well, Sam, that is a great question. 
Mark, along with many influential Imagineers, worked on the original Disneyland Haunted Mansion attraction, so you will see influences from each and every one of them. But the other Imagineer who had a large influence on the Haunted Mansion is someone we will meet later on. Oh, I'm so excited to learn more about that. So, Archimedes, who is this lady in the portrait next to Mark? Ah, that, my boy, is Miss Alice. She is Mark's beloved wife. She was also an Imagineer. Let's listen to the historians tell us about their love story. Mark and Alice were a dynamic duo when it came to character development. Mark conceptualized the characters while Alice dressed them. To date, they are the only Imagineering couple to have dedication windows on Main Street USA for their contributions to Disneyland. Mark first met Alice when he was teaching the animation drawing class at Chouinard Institute. A female costume design student had fought her way into the male-dominated animation class. This was none other than Alice Estes. While having a promising career outside of the Walt Disney Company, Alice was contacted one day by her former animation instructor, Mark Davis, and he asked her to design a dress for the live-action model of Princess Aurora for Sleeping Beauty. After their marriage, Mark had introduced Alice to Walt, and Walt saw great potential in her. Alice got a very important call years later because Walt wanted her to create the costumes for It's a Small World. Alice leaped at the chance to work with Mary Blair on this project. The Small World project took from all three Imagineers' strengths, Mark's humor, Mary's vibrant and whimsical styling, and Alice's pattern and fabric expertise. Mark and Alice also worked together on General Electric's Carousel of Progress for the 1964-65 World's Fair. Now, I know that we don't talk about it in the story, but Mark and Alice had a love affair that lasted for decades. And being able to work with their spouse was something that was a great gift to them. And, and you can see that in the rare photos that you see of them together on set or at Disneyland. Now, back in the 1960s, photos weren't taken as regularly as they are now. So the few that we have of the two of them are absolute treasures. And I think, and again, my personal opinion, if they hadn't gotten married, we wouldn't have had the icons that we do today. I also think that Mark wouldn't have been pushed to do certain things in his animation and then his Imagineering as he did. Um, and then also, flip that around, I don't necessarily think that without Mark, Alice would have been as influential as she was. It's funny, we earlier mentioned that Mark got dubbed as the ladies' man for his work with the Disney princesses, but it's also interesting to look at this in a real-life aspect, too, being able to work with his wife uh, at the same place and on some of the same projects, and those projects have definitely stood the test of time and some of the most influential in Disney parks. So we wanted to make sure that we focused on Mark while giving a nod to Alice because she is just as important to not just Mark but to Walt Disney Imagineering as a whole. So we wanted to make sure that we gave her a little thank you, a little nod to say thank you for everything that you did while focusing on their collaboration together. So we decided to choose Mark as an Imagineering legend because he represents blank to us. Brian, what word would you use to describe Mark? You know, I put a lot of thought into this and... The word that I kept going back to was luminary. He was just always striving to push the envelope to find a better way to present his art form. If he wasn't constantly studying animals and people and the way that they moved and the way that they interacted with others, I don't think that we would have the classic movies and the classic attractions that we do today. I mean, the films that he and the nine old men worked on and that the attractions that the original Imagineers worked on, they stand the test of time. I mean, here we are, we've had 60 years at Disneyland, and we're pushing 50 years at Walt Disney World, and the attractions that these individuals worked on are still classic, and we still love them. Take, for example, the Jungle Cruise. It still has an 80-minute wait, no matter what time of year it is. You either love it or you hate it, but it still has an 80-minute wait. Haunted Mansion still has... A 80 plus minute wait. All these attractions could stand on their own in other theme parks around the world and still be classics. But then go on the flip side and you look at the, the animated films and we're still meeting those characters in the parks. We're still watching those films with our kids. We That's what we grew up on even though we weren't even born when they came out. When 
you ask somebody, what was the first Disney film that you ever watched? It's going to be one of these classic films, to put, no matter what decade that you're in. No matter what decade you were born in. So, with him always pushing the envelope, that's why I decided to go with this word. Because without him, much like all of these individuals that we're going to talk about this season, without him, we wouldn't, we wouldn't have what we love today. You mentioned the commitment to his art form, and I think that's really neat because he had his own very distinct style. When you're going through these attractions, all those that you mentioned and how influential and how they stand the test of time, all of that, all that's like really important, but it's very easy for somebody to pick out a Mark Davis character. They definitely have their own style, and going through these attractions, once you kind of see his style once, you can easily pick out the characters that he worked on because he did have his own style, and he was able to really bring that and express himself in this way. Oh, absolutely. And how many other Imagineers, both in the past and currently, can you say that? I mean, you can look at the work of Joe Rohde, and you can say, oh, I know he worked on that because it's so elaborate, or it's got the throwback to conservation. Like, you know that that's his niche. With Mark, his characters just stand out I think above everybody else's because they're there, they're unique, and they're original to him. Absolutely. So what word did you decide to use, Stokes? The single word that I went with this time is fearless. Uh, I think a lot of times we call back to Walt having that vision of being able to pull his Imagineers from the animation studio and from all these other parts of the Disney company. But I think especially with Mark Davis, we need to focus on the bravery that it takes for those animators and those people that are really stepping way out of their comfort zone to go help Walt out and create this new form of entertainment at the time. So fearless is the way I look at it because the confidence that you have to do that has to be really unimaginable. That's really interesting because, I mean, for all of us diehard Disney fans, we know that Walt wasn't great with money. And to get these individuals who were already in place in their position and already the leaders in their fields in animation to take a risk. Now, Walt Disney was the ultimate risk taker. But I think that these animators that then became Imagineers are right there in step with him, as you said, and are fearless because they blindly followed him. Now, he had a vision and it took the likes of Herb Ryman sitting in a room with him all weekend to design the map of Disneyland. But still, then it was just a drawing. All of these individuals came over blindly, blind faith, and that because they knew that Walt was going to take care of them. Exactly, and I think the perfect story for Mark Davis in this situation is one that we uh, mentioned earlier, where Walt said, your first assignment is go to Disneyland and tell me what you think it needs. That's a really big order right there. Not only are you having to go figure something out in a world that, that that's that big and that themed already and that immersive, but your boss is asking you to critique his own work and tell him how to make it better. So the confidence that that has to have from Mark Davis to come back and give an honest opinion, and obviously an opinion that ended up being a game changer for them, is truly special. And you know, I've got, I got one final point based off of that, and... You know, everybody always wonders, well, what would Walt think of the parks now? And what would he think of this attraction or that attraction? I wonder if Mark was alive today, if he was given that exact same task, go into the park and critique it. I wonder what he would say. So I want to leave that and just as a, as a food for thought. We always wonder what Walt would think. What would Mark think? And how would Mark want to make it better? Now let's look to you, the listener. What do you think Mark's ideas and thoughts would be about the current state of the parks? You know what our ideas are based off of previous shows. We want to hear about your ideas. So leave us a message, either a comment on one of our posts, or send us a direct message on any of our social media platforms. Let us know, and we'll share some of your ideas out on social media later on in the month. Tune in next month as Archimedes leads us into a new adventure in the Hall of Imagineering, as we learn the told and untold stories of another Imagineer. You've been listening to the Main Street Chronicles, part of the Imagination Radio Network and a BRS production. The whole thing with creativity is there's always something new to do out there.
Why not give it a try? Would you like to go on another adventure? Hey, Archimedes, you guys have a lot of amazing things going on here at the Main Street Chronicles. Is there a way for listeners to support you? Why, yes, yes, you can. You can go on the Anchor app and click on Listener Support, and you can donate as much or as little as you'd like. We appreciate everyone's support. Thank you.